I um, often will use that phrase, the Lord be with you, and you say, and also with you. Um, in church services, we say it all the time throughout a worship service, but sometimes it gets used by people trying to calm crowds and large rooms. Have you ever noticed that in Episcopal circles? This is something that sometimes they do. They'll they'll try to get the attention of a, of a rowdy group, kind of like y'all were this this evening. Um, and um, this one guy was was uh, messing with the microphone, one of the preachers, and he was hitting the microphone and it wasn't on and he kept trying to get the crowd to be quiet and he said, the Lord be with you and nobody was listening. They just kept on talking and then he got a little louder, the Lord be with you and he says, I think something's wrong with this microphone. And everybody says, and also with you. You know, one of the reasons actually why I don't uh, use that to quiet crowds is actually because it has a very sacred meaning in the context of Christian worship. We have been saying that little uh, verse and response since the early days of Christian history, back over 2,000 years ago. And what it is saying and what it's acknowledging about what's going on in the context of our worship is that when we gather as the people of God with... um, a minister leading and and the gathered assembly of the faithful Christians, the saints, that Jesus Christ is actually the one who is leading the worship service, and Jesus Christ is actually the one who is participating in the worship service. In other words, we are the body of Christ. We're the body of Jesus gathered here, and through mysteriously the gift of his Holy Spirit, the risen Lord Jesus Christ is present with us in our assembly and not only leading our worship, but empowering us to participate in it. And so when I say, the Lord be with you, and you say, and also with you, what we are both acknowledging is that Jesus Christ is in us and working in our midst. Um, There's a, a wonderful imagery of this in the book of Revelation where it describes uh, Jesus walking among the lampstand of his church. And uh, we symbolize that actually with a lot of the candles and things that we light uh, to, to recognize the light of Christ among us and the, the, and the presence of the spirit of the living God among us. So um, as I'm we're going it through the book of Hebrews, one of the big, big points of the book of Hebrews. And if you get this point, you'll actually understand how the entire letter it works, is that it's Jesus who is leading us in a worship service. So when you hear the scriptures read, the word of God, um, both read as Ann Lowry did, or, or the gospel being proclaimed, or the relevant word being preached, that it's actually the word of Jesus that is coming to us and through us. And so we need to be paying attention to it, is what the writer of Hebrews says. Pay attention. Um, The other uh, thing that the writer of Hebrews is saying is that Jesus is our great high priest who is actually leading us, and he calls it the throne of grace, into his mystical presence of communion as our great high priest. And in our passage for today, it describes him as being a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And so what I want to do with you tonight is talk to you about what that means. What does it mean that Jesus is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek? And I actually am going to connect this up with um, the concept of giving and why we give and and what we're doing when we give in the context of church. And I I know that if you're visiting today, uh, one of the main reasons why people are like, oh no, the one day I come to church is the church is going to be talking about giving. Uh, No, we don't typically do do it all every single Sunday here, but um, but we're in, it fits in the context of what we're talking about with the subject of Melchizedek. Last week, we talked about what does it mean to enter into Sabbath? And, and this week, we'll think about what does it mean to enter into to giving of self and to tithing. And 
the Lord is asking for, from us a seventh of our time and a tenth of what he's given to us in the material blessings that we receive. But first of all, let's think about well, what are we giving to? Or maybe a better way to phrase it is, who are we giving to? The, the scripture says it this way, that Jesus is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Well, who is Melchizedek? And what does that have to do with giving? Well, Melchizedek is talked about three times in the Bible. The first time is in Genesis chapter 14. And Abraham, who is the patriarch of Israel and the father of all the faithful, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, one of the three patriarchs, but he's the father Abraham that we sing about. And Father Abraham uh, engaged in some various battles and had some wars with some of the surrounding tribal leaders. And he actually amassed a bit of, of a fortune, gained some wealth through his battles. And so what the scriptures describe in Genesis chapter 14 is that he encounters a particular king named Melchizedek, who is the king of Salem. And uh, Abraham shares communion with them, actually. He partakes in bread and wine with Melchizedek. And then Melchizedek blesses him. And Abraham tithes to Melchizedek a tenth of his spoils of everything is what it says. He gives him a tenth of everything. Interesting. Then the second place that Melchizedek is described in the Bible is in Psalm 110, kind of in the middle of the Bible. And that's a psalm that's about the coming of the Messiah, where the King David is, is praying and he's reflecting on the Messiah. And he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. And he's anticipating that there would be an heir of his own, a son that will come down his lineage that will be his Lord. And then later on in the psalm, he says, the Lord swears that you will be called a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And then the third place that the Bible talks about Melchizedek is actually in our passage for today in Hebrews. Hebrews chapters 5, 6, and 7. The writer goes on for three chapters about this guy. And what he's doing is he's saying that is the high priesthood of Jesus. That when we come and we, we bring in the offerings of our lives and our heart and our labor to the Lord, that the one who is here to welcome our offerings, whether those come in the form of financial gifts, but also the offerings of our hearts and the offering of our praises and our worship and our music, that that, that is all being offered to our great high priest, Jesus who is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, why Melchizedek? Why would he be in that order? Well, Melchizedek's name actually has a special meaning. Melech and Sedek form the etymology of his name, which means he is the king. Melech means king and Sedek means righteousness. That Mel Melchizedek is the king of righteousness. So Jesus is the king of righteousness. He's also the, the king of Salem, which will become known as the city Jerusalem, which is the city of peace. In the scriptures, Jerusalem is always a holy, holy, holy city, even back in the time of Abraham. And Melchizedek was the king of Jerusalem. And so Jesus is not only the king of righteousness, but he's also the king of peace. I, I marvel at how much money is spent on our um, elections to elect a leader for four years. I mean, it's, it's gotten into not just the millions of dollars, but the billions of dollars of money that people give to get a person into an office where Yes, they are very important, and particularly in the United States, uh, we call them the leader of the free world. I mean, there's, that's a powerful office. But they promise and promise 
those two things, if you'll listen to them carefully. They promise justice and righteousness, and they promise peace and prosperity. And the problem is, is that for all of their inventions and, and devices, no human being can provide the righteousness and peace that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords can provide. And, it, and so part of the, the argument of the book of Hebrews, particularly these chapters, is that all of the human institutions that have come along, but particularly the ones that were leading up to the time of Jesus, were governed by human beings that were finite in their capacities and their abilities. They were never able to really, truly um, provide and deliver on the promises of their offices until the one who has come, who is both the king of righteousness and the king of peace. Now, um, Melchizedek, it says this about him in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1 through 3. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and he blessed him. And to Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, the king of righteousness. And then he's also the king of Salem, that is, the king of peace. Now listen to this. This is a very interesting thing that he says about Melchizedek. He is without father or mother or genealogy having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. What the preacher of Hebrews is arguing is actually that Melchizedek is a type of Jesus Christ. And some scholars, and I kind of think this myself, believe that Melchizedek is actually a pre-incarnate version of Jesus, that, that Jesus came and appeared at various times to various people. Like, who was Adam and Eve walking with when they were walking with God in the cool of the, of the morning? But some type of pre-incarnate experience that was manifest in their presence. Um, something like this was who Melchizedek was. The, the writer of Hebrews saying, this is no ordinary guy. This is somebody that out of all of Genesis, where it always tells who their parents are and who they descend, and so-and-so beget so-and-so who beget so-and-so, you don't read any of that for him. And what it means is, is that Melchizedek had neither beginning nor end. In other words, his priestly kingdom was one that was eternal. And this is why, and the writer of Hebrews is making a big point about this, that, that Jesus has an eternal high priesthood, a kingly priesthood. So when we're giving, we're giving to a person. We're not giving to St. Mark's. We're not giving to the ministry of Charlie Holt or Billy Servany or, or um, whatever. What we're giving to is the ministry of the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. And, and our perspective in giving ought to be of that ilk. And, that, and again, we're not just talking about the giving of money, but we're talking about the giving of our lives. So what are we giving? Well, I've already mentioned this briefly, but we're giving our time and our resources, the Sabbath and a tithe. In Genesis chapter 14, it says it this way, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God most high. And he blessed Abraham, and he said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Now, um, tithing literally means a tenth. And the Lord wants a seventh of our time and a tenth of our resources given to him. And that's a lot. I remember when I was um, a young seminarian is when I started to try to live that literally. And, and I wasn't making a whole lot of money back then. So I'd get like $100 and I'd give away $10. 
make $200. I'll give away, what, $20. Oh, good, you can do math. Um, so I was like, this tithing stuff isn't too hard. It's like, you know, giving away a cup of coffee or a hamburger or whatever it is. And, uh, but then I, I got a big check. I got a, a check for not just, you know, $1,000. It was literally $5,000 that was matched. It was a scholarship matched by a, a person's um, company. And so $10,000 was given to me. So what's 10% of that? $1,000. I had never made that much money in my life in one sitting and much less tithed a check like that. I wrote was to the church, a $1,000 check. And it taught a bit of money than a lot of money. It's really hard for me to do it. And I, I was like, well, I could really use all this. And all the things kind of went through my head about what, what that $1,000 represented. But then I kind of came back to this idea. I'm trying to be faithful to this in my practice. And God has always given. And when I gave away $10, the Lord provided, you know, 200 So when the Lord abundance on my life, why am I having such a hard time giving this away? I remember when um, I would got interested in this young lady named Brooke and we were we were really kind of dating and excited and I I knew the day that I met her that I wanted to marry her and so I called up her her mother and and I just kind of was trying to fish around for Brooke's ring size and and of course you know my mother-in-law Karen she immediately knew that I was going to asked the question. And she, so she says, you're not getting Brooks ring size. And I said, well, I really need it. I, I need, I need that for something. And, and she goes, you're going to ask her dad's hand in marriage. If you're going to do this, when can we meet? She wanted to meet with me first. And so we went out to lunch, me and my future mother-in-law, Karen, and we sat down at the lunch table and she says, um, now my daughter has been raised in such a way that she has very high standards. How are you going to afford it? You're a poor seminarian. And I, I said, well, you know, the Lord's always provided for me. It's kind of the way I looked at it. And she goes, well, Charlie, money doesn't just fall out of the sky. And I said, well, it kind of does for me. And so, like, it doesn't for me, and I'm not sure about this. This is a, this is a true story. Later on that week, um, my grandfather sold a fish camp that he owned down on the east coast of Florida, low, um, down near Edgewater, Mosquito Lagoon. And, uh, and he sold the fish camp and he distributed to the entire family um, these wonderful pre-inheritance checks. Big check in the mail that week. And the first thing I did was take it to my mother-in-law and stick it into her face. And she goes, well, I guess the Lord does send money out of the sky for you. Now, I, I don't want to um, say that I have been, or my wife and I have tithed perfectly. Through, have definitely tried to do that throughout our entire married life. Much more faithful about that than others. And, and there have been times, and in fact, we're in a season right now where there's, there always seems to be more expenses than the income that's coming in. And, and a lot of it has to do with children in college. And we had one that got married this year. And so there's just been a lot of big bills. And so, you know, giving away uh, is really, really tough in these days and age. And, and, you know, part of why I'm telling you that is actually to back up what the writer of Hebrews is saying about earthly pastors and priests. One of the reasons why we can relate to you is because we actually have the exact same struggles as you. We know what, it, what it's like to, to have more month than money and to have difficulties in, in paying the bills because, you know, we do too. And yet um, the example is actually not me that we are to be following. 
but the Lord Jesus Christ. When James and John came to Jesus and they said, you know, will you do something for us? Whatever. We you know, that's a loaded question. Whenever your children come to you and go, will you, Dad, will you do whatever, whatever I want? Well, what do you want? That's what Jesus responds. Well, what do you want? He goes, well, we want to, you know, when you get into your glory and you get all that good stuff and you're, and you're like powerful and you're wealthy and you have the rule and the kingdom and all of that, we want to sit at your left hand and your right hand. Oh, guys, I'm sure Jesus is like, oy vey, you guys do not know what you're asking. So, oh, yes, we do. Well, can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? Can you drink the cup that I'm going to Oh, yes, we can do it. You will drink that cup, and you will be baptized with that baptism. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not for me to give. It's my Father ordains these things. And then he teaches them a pretty hard lesson about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. He says, you know, when you talk about Gentile rulers and, and the politicians of our age, they always lord it over people. They're all about power and resources and money and trying to, to, to be the top. He goes, but whoever wants to be my follower must be the last. You need to take on in the spirit of one who served and one who's come to give. And he says, the son of man, talking about himself, did not come to lord it over people, but to give his life as a ransom for many. What the writer of Hebrews is wanting to say to us when it comes to the generosity of our hearts is not to look to the generosity of our earthly spiritual leaders, but to look to the generosity of the one who gave everything for us, the Lord Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews um, says that he became like us in every way, that he went through every kind of temptation, every trial, every difficulty, and yet persevered all the way to the end without sin. That he did that in order to lay down his life for us as an offering and a sacrifice once for all. Not only is he the high priest, but he also gave his life as the sacrifice that the priest would make in order to pay the full price, not just for my lack of faithfulness and bringing in, for every weaknesses and sins and failings when it comes to the Lord and yours too. And so what the writer of Hebrews is saying that when we tithe, we are not just selves at a tenth, but giving of our lives to the one who gave his life for us. The last thing I would just say is that when we give, we're giving um, to not to something that is passing away or that will one day wear out or die even, but when we're giving to the kingdom of God and to the ministry of Jesus Christ, we are, we are actually giving to the most life-giving thing that this world has ever offered. Listen to the way that the book of Hebrews puts it. He says, in one case, tithes are received by mortal men. He's talking about the gifts and offerings that were made during the Levitical priesthood and how the money was going to keep up the tabernacle and the temple and pay for the lambs and the pigeons and things like that and pay the salaries of the priests. And he says, those tithes and those offerings were being given to an institution that was passing away, to a priesthood filled with people who were going to die, and to things that were all going to one day become obsolete. But the gifts and offerings that we make, he says, in the other case, the tithes are received by one whom it is testified that he lives. He has the eternal life and the eternal priesthood, an indestructible life. 
And when we give to the person in the ministry of Jesus Christ, we are making an investment, not only an eternity for ourselves and the benefits come back to us, and this is part of the gift of the blessing of giving is that we are blessed to be a blessing. And so as the Lord is pouring out his life and his abundance upon us and the, the river of grace and the, and the source and the fount of life is, is infusing us, we then become a conduit of that very life and the generosity that we pour out to Jesus. And he uses that to bring life and abundance and care and ministry and redemption and salvation to people all around this community and in this world who are desperate for life because we are surrounded by a culture of brokenness and, and death and things that are wearing out and breaking down and going to chaos. And Jesus is the only one who brings life in the midst of that death, destruction, and chaos. And so when we give, we give with a purpose. To um, say yes to the life that we've received and to invest in the life of the kingdom of God as it makes itself manifest and visible in the presence of this generation of the body of Christ in the presence of the risen Lord Jesus.